Wow. I love it when we get to pray like that in church for somebody. And Wednesday evening we'll be praying like that too. If there's, if there's a need for, to be anointed or have hands laid on us and prayed for, we will do that. And I'm looking forward to Wednesday evening at 6.30 for our prayer vigil. Giving the greatest gift of all time. God promised promise this gift at the very beginning. In fact, it was agreed upon even before the foundations of the, of the universe were laid. And it was discussed and understood that this would be the case. That Christ was, was wounded and bruised. He was, he was slain even before the foundations of the world were laid. They saw this and they planned it. And how amazing that is. And I, I think back and I wonder about that. It was, Jesus was with his disciples. And I was wondering this week as he talked to them and he shared with them, he said things like this. In John 20, this is, this is in the last chapter of John, one of the last things Jesus told his disciples was uh, he said to them again. So he had said this previously at, at different times because it was important that they understood this. When God repeats himself, it's not because he forgot that he told you something. It's because he knows we need to have it reinforced and driven deeper into our minds and our hearts. He said, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also am sending you. I also send you. The same way the Father sent me, now there's a big statement. There's a lot to be un unpacked in that statement. We're going to look at that just for a few minutes today. Jesus was born in a barn. The king of kings, the creator of the universe, before he leaves heaven, he knows this is going to happen. Now, obviously, obvious as a little baby, you don't know what's happening. But for the king, the creator of the universe to say, yes, I see what's going to happen down there, um, I'm going. Now, I just have to ask this question. How many of you have ever slept on, on hay in a barn uh, or in a stall? You slept in a, a dairy barn or a, a horse barn or a, any kind of an animal barn on straw? How many of you have ever done that? Well, we are definitely in the minority because I've done it too. And, you know, it's interesting that you know when, the, when you've got a good uh, farmer on your hands when the barn smells clean. But I have to tell you that most, a lot of barns don't smell that clean. And I don't know how this one smelled. I don't know how good they were doing. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, maxed out crowd. I know that they, they rode their donkeys, they, they, their carts, maybe very few of them were wealthy enough to own horses, but they brought their donkeys and there were sheep and this and that. And so I don't know, the, the owner may have been so busy taking care of all the, the influx of people coming to town, kind of like when you have a Super Bowl somewhere and the town is just, all the hotels are booked up. I don't think it was smelling that good in that barn. But I do know that when you're in a clean barn and you lay down on that hay, it smells good. It's a, it's a healthy, it's a wholesome feeling. Now, they didn't have electric outlets in this barn for heaters. They didn't have those kind of things. This was the raw elements and we have baby Jesus in a, in a manger. Now, a manger is where animals eat out of. They eat out of that manger. And I've been around enough cows and horses and sheep to know that when they eat, slobber comes out on that manger. And there's a lot of that stuff. Now, I'm sure that Joseph was a good husband, and I'm sure he cleaned it as good as he could. I, I, I'm, I want to talk to him. I said, what all, what'd you have to do? D did you clean the whole barn before you let Mary go in there? What, what did you have to do? Did you go buy some new hay, some new straw, and lay it down so that it was the first straw that any uh, creature had ever uh, seen or touched, uh, you know, other than the harvesters? I want to ask him those kind of questions. What, how long did it take you to get that barn ready, that stable? I, I mean, we're going to have eternity. So you might as well get a real good list of things to ask Joseph. I mean, wow, we're going to ask Joseph some things, aren't we? And that should be on the list, I think. And 
little baby Jesus, amazing, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. It's, it's more beautiful than any of us can ever imagine. It's more wonderful than any of us can, can describe. And, and little baby Jesus. And I, I'm telling you, look at that. I, I know that the sheep and the, little, the, the doves, the cows and the crazy donkeys, man, they were overwhelmed. You, you, you know, animals can be overwhelmed. I had, a, I had a black lab and I had a yellow lab. And I tell you what, if we were gone for a couple of days, we had, we had them on self-feeders. And you don't want to put a dog on self-feeders because they'll overeat and they'll get real big. But these labs never overate. They were on self-feeders and they never got heavy. And, and if we were gone for two or three days and we'd come back, they were overwhelmed. But black labs are like that. But then I found out, that our, what, what kind of dog does David and Rachel have? A Yorkie. Yorkies get overwhelmed too. I think parakeets get overwhelmed. If you're away for a day or two and you don't, your parakeets don't see you. I think animals have the ability to love because God created them. And it's real clear that some of them have lost that ability because of the curse of sin. Some of them have become very vicious and heinous and violent predators like lions. Now you can tame a lion... But if you tame it, you play with it, not me, because that's the way they are. And even then, they might turn on you. But a turtle dove won't turn on you. And a parakeet, yeah, they're kind of, they might turn on you. But these animals were subdued. I'm sure of it. I'm going to ask Joseph about that. What did the animals say? Now, I know Mr. Ed wasn't there, the talking horse. He, I'm sure he wasn't there. But I know animals talk. Crows actually have a language, and we've been able to decipher it. We actually know what crows say. Go look it up. We actually know what their, what their sounds are actually telling their little buddies. They have lookouts. They have all kinds of things that they do. And so I'm going to ask Joseph, did you hear those animals say anything that night that you'd never heard them say before? Did, did they make sounds? Did you hear them humming or singing? Did you hear them doing something you'd never heard an animal do? And I'm going to wait to hear what he had to say. And I, I'm almost 100% sure that he's going to say, yeah, yeah, I did. They were, they were singing hallelujah, and, and it was real. Because I know you go on YouTube, and they have taught dogs to sing and you can actually tell what they're saying it's actually you can tell what the words are and and birds parrots talk don't tell me the creator of the universe is born in a cattle stall and those those and, and the holy spirit's not having those animals talk I, I may be wrong but i want to get there and some people say oh dogs don't go to heaven well that's your opinion but I'm going to get there, and I'm going to assemble that group. If God takes them to heaven, I'm going to assemble them. If he doesn't, I'm going to assemble their descendants. And I'm going to say, I'd like for you to sing the same song that they were singing that night in Bethlehem. And I want to listen to it. Why not? You know, people think that's crazy. I don't think it's crazy. Whales, they sing. We've recorded their songs. They actually have love songs that they sing when it's mating season. They have other songs that they sing when it's hunting season. Two totally different songs that they sing. So we need to be a little more like children when it comes to receiving the Christmas story and all that is wrapped up in it. I can't wait to, to see what all is there. Mary was there, shepherds. There's the cow. The guy's leaning on the cow. Now, you can't lean on a cow unless that cow's really, really worn out or really tamed or, or is this your best friend. And maybe that's true. Maybe that cow was one of his best buddies. But I, I just, you ever, those of you that had babies, I mean, you can sit there and look at them all day, even when they're sleeping. You just look at them and you just watch them. Amen? 
It's like they have these monitors now, these little viewer screen, little viewer deals, and they have the, the, the camera. And now you can sit in your living room and watch the baby sleep for hours. And they, and they maybe move every 30 minutes, and you go, oh, look, he moved. Oh, look, she turned her head. You know, I mean, it's just beautiful, isn't it? Well, that's what Mary was doing. Can you imagine? She knew that she had never known a man. She knew that Gabriel had talked to her. She knew that the Holy Spirit had conceived in her the living Word of God to be the God-man. She knew all that. I can't imagine how long she just looked at baby Jesus and didn't say a thing, didn't even want to breathe because she didn't want to disturb the moment. You ever had a situation like that where everything was so beautiful, oh, I better not move because I might interrupt the beautiful that is happening right now. I mean, this was amazing. This was fabulous. But Jesus came. The Christmas story is not about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. A little bit about it, but not, that's not what it's all about. Jesus came to save us from our sin. He came to show us the way out of here, and he came to teach us how to get out of here. And not only that, he came to show us and teach us how to help other people get out of here. God gave the greatest gift of all time, and God is in the business, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit is in the business of teaching you and teaching me and showing us and empowering us to be able to give the greatest gift of all time, just like he gave it, just like God the Father gave it, the Holy Spirit's in the business of teaching us how to give that gift. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to do. It's the greatest gift you can give anyone, anywhere. And if you can't give this gift, if you're not in the place right now where you have the ability to give the gift, the greatest gift of all eternity, then your giving is very shallow. It, it's, it may be fun. And it may be exciting, but it won't last forever. The gift that God gave, the gift that the Holy Spirit's working hard to help us to learn how to give, now that giving, that gift lasts forever. And somebody says, well, I, know I can't do much. I'm just not very good. I don't know what I can do. I, who's going to listen to me? I don't know what to do. I, you know, people don't even like me. I mean, that's common, you know. That's what the devil tells me, and that's what I buy, and I, I end up echoing that for an excuse. In fact, I gave God the same excuse when he first called me. He came down in that big concert, that big rock and roll concert in Boulder, Colorado, with 100,000-plus screaming, crazy, wild, druggy, hippie, wacko, Screaming and yelling at this car. He came down at about 1.30 in the afternoon and he said, Paul, will you help me rescue this generation from destruction? That's what it was. Will you help me rescue this generation from destruction? And I heard him as clear as a bell. The group War was singing. Beach Boys were there, Three Dog Night and War, and I think the Doobie Brothers. The group War was singing, and they were singing the song, Why Can't We Be Friends? And I looked around, and people were throwing up on each other. It was pitiful. It was hot, and they'd been drinking beer and smoking dope and who knows what else, eating bad food, and they were, there was people throwing up on each other. There was sexual molestation going on, and I was in shock. I was, it was disgusting that I was even there. I couldn't believe that I'd allowed myself to become that degenerated to where I thought that was fun. And by two, one, 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the afternoon, these things were happening. Ambulances were coming, hauling people off. The police, security were coming and breaking up fights. All kinds of ugliness. It was back in the crazy days. And, and it's getting just as crazy now, even more crazy. 
And he literally came down. He says, will you help me rescue this generation from destruction? My answer was, what can I do? I don't know. I can't help anybody. I'm a, I'm a total, I'm a, I'm a mess. My whole life is messed up. I, 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 I can't, I don't know what to say to people. Nobody's going to listen to what I have to say. How can I help you? So I said that. He said, he didn't even answer that. He's, the second time he said it, he was a little more firm and he was almost upset. And he said, will you help me rescue this generation from destruction? I knew he was upset. I, I didn't know who it was, but I said, well, I better not argue. I said, okay, whatever. Yeah, I'll do whatever I can. Sure, why not? That was the greatest answer I ever gave to God. That got me going. So I don't care where you're at. I mean, you can't be worse off than I was. There's no way. I was suicidal. I lived on the 11th floor of a 12-floor dormitory, Tory, and I used to look out the window, and I'd think about jumping out the window because nobody wanted me around, nobody cared about me, I was a loser, and I, my life was messed up, and I just, you know, that, that went through my mind many times. I'd drive home, six, seven, eight-hour drive, and many times the little voice would say, why don't you just run right into that bridge and just end it all because nobody likes you, they don't need you, and you're such a a loser anyway, and I almost bought it, but that's the enemy of God. I cheated my way through most of high school. I cheated my way through most of college. I'm talking big time cheating, where the football coaches would sneak into the offices of my teachers and steal the tests the day before, and we'd study the tests all night. Now, when you study the test, you're going to do pretty good. And so that's what we did a lot. And when Jesus came into my life, I couldn't even study. I didn't know how to study. Last time I had studied, maybe it was the fifth grade. So I asked God to help me. Don't, don't tell me you can't do it. I don't, know, I don't know of too many people that were more messed up than me. There may be some, but not many. God will lead you to be able to lift up this story. And we want to get to the real meat of Christmas right here. Jesus, talking to his disciples, said some other things. And as you go, preach. Now this word preach does not mean pulpit preaching. This means share, verbal, talk to people, tell them. This is not something you, you have to do at a pulpit. This is something you do over your backyard fence. This word, it means to converse, have conversations, tell people, share information over your backyard fence or at the gas station or wherever you're at, the grocery store, the beach, wherever you're at, share this and tell them the kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven has come. It's time to roll. And then he sells, he, now, when, when God told Mary, you're going to have a baby, the Holy One, and you need to prepare yourself, Mary. She goes, well, how can that be? I can't have a baby. I've never known a man. The Holy Spirit will come over you, overshadow you. Well, that's a pretty big order for a teenage girl. And he's telling these guys, and, and these guys were, had all the problems that you and I have. Maybe more. They may, they may have had more problems and more weaknesses than, than most of us, or maybe all of us, because God comes and shows that no matter how weak you are, he can still use you to do great things. I mean, Peter was the kind of guy nobody wanted to hang around. He's always bragging and telling what, how great he was and how he'd do this or that and, and, and competing for who's going to be closest to Jesus and all that. He says, go and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's pretty much what Jesus was doing. Add, feed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fish. And some of that happened after Jesus left too. And here's the key. Freely you have received. Freely give. This is the major key. Now God doesn't call us all to go cast out demons or raise the dead. Some of us may never even meet a leper, 
or heal the sick. He, he may not call us all to do that, but He calls us all to be a part of it. And if you faithfully pray every day for the body of Christ, for the family of God, for the ministry of the gospel, if you faithfully pray every day, every time the Holy Spirit heals someone in this world, you're a part of it. If you're simply a prayer warrior and you faithfully pray every day, you're a part of God healing the people who get healings. And you need to own that. Because you're part of the team. You're part of the, of the company, the family. You're, you're helping to lift that burden. Apostles can't do this kind of stuff unless somebody's praying. And the reason we don't see the kind of stuff that they saw is because we're not praying the way they prayed. We got plenty of hired gun shooters, gunslingers. We can call in evangelists. We can call in all kinds of fancy, gifted people. But I want to tell you something. Nothing eternal will happen unless the church is praying the way they prayed in the book of Acts. And if you don't know how they prayed in the book of Acts, you need to start in chapter 1 and just walk right through it. And pray and ask God, say, God, I'm going to read the book of Acts, and I'm going to, I'm going to trust and believe that by the time I get to the end of it, I'm going to have what they got. And you're going to give me more of what they got. And every time I read it, I'll get a little more. And that's real. So this is an impossible mission for humans. Humans can't do that. You, you know, how, how, can, how can fishermen and tax collectors and people like that, how can they go raise dead people? That hadn't happened since the days of Elijah. But it started happening right after Jesus left. They all got together. He left. He had to go. He said, it's necessary that I leave because I can't be everywhere at once. I have become limited. I am no longer omnipresent. Jesus gave that up forever to become our Savior. He says, but it, so it's vital, it's urgent, it's necessary that I go, it's expedient for you it's, that I go so the Holy Spirit can come and he can represent me. And man, they got together and they'd been up there for 10 days fasting and praying and, and, and asking for other people to pray. Say, so, you know, I've been having this struggle with this. I'm so jealous of you. I can't hardly stand it. And you probably know it already, but I, I talk about you. I try to make people think you're not as good as you really are because I'm jealous. And then they would pray for each other. Isn't that awesome? And this went on for 10 days. And this is what happened on the 10th day. 120 of them up there, men and women. And the world has never been the same since. It's amazing what God can do. And I guarantee you, we get together more and more like they did, we will have the same experience because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he has no favorites. He shows no favoritism. What he's done for one, he's ready to do and will do for all. That's our God. We know who our God is. He's pure. He's holy. He's faithful. And he is just. We will have these same experiences. And here's another major key. There are keys to the kingdom, but we have to take hold of them and then we can go forth and give the greatest gift of all time. We can receive the same power, the same wisdom, the same skill, the same ability through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through the presence of God. We can do this. Any of us can do this. He is not limited by your or my limitations. All he needs is access to our inner being on a continuous basis, on an everyday continuous basis. And, and here's, what, here's what we have. Here's what John, the same guy who wrote Revelation, same guy who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he said, but as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them he gave power. Now here it's the word exousia in the Greek. 
It's not dunamis. Dunamis is the word for dynamite. But this power, exousia, includes dynamite. This is actually a bigger word than the word for dynamite. In the Acts chapter 1, he says you will receive dunamis. You will receive power, uh, energy. You'll, you'll, you'll receive get up and go power. Get up and go energy. That's, but here you're not only receiving get up and go energy and power, you're receiving authority, exousia. And this authority thing is big time important. You will, he will give you power and authority to become children of God, to be able to cast out demons, to be able to heal the sick, to be able to raise the dead, to be able to tell people why Jesus came to Bethlehem, to be able to tell people why Jesus went to the cross, to be able to tell people that he is alive and he's here right now and he will help you with any problem you can ever face. And I, I want to ask you to pray with me right now. Could I pray with you right now? He will give you the power. He will give you the wisdom. He'll give you the skill to do that simply because you have received Jesus Christ. That's how huge and wonderful Jesus really is. To those who believe in his name. Wow. That's exciting. And that's exciting. This is what Christmas is all about, folks. If Jesus doesn't come back, Bethlehem is worthless. We have no hope. If he's not risen from the dead, and if he's not coming back, we might as well fold up and go get drunk and party and run wild with the rest of them. Or, or, or Actually, it would be better if there is no God and if there is no Jesus, why should we live? We're going to self-destruct and tear each other to pieces if he's not there to help us, to protect us. I want to look back here. That will cause you to love this event. In 2 Timothy 4.8, the Bible says that he is coming. The Apostle Paul says this about himself. He says, he says, I know he's coming for me. And I know he's going to give me a crown. He's coming for me, and he's going to give me a crown. And he says, and not only me. He says, everyone who loves his appearing, he's going to do the same thing. He's going to give you a crown of life, immortality, eternal life. He's coming, and he's going to do that for you. And I tell you what, I'm excited. I, if you love his return, here's the key. Here's the evidence. If you really love his return, you're telling people about it. And if you're not telling people about it, you ain't got it. Now, that's a real serious clue right there, folks. Now, you may have had it 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But most people usually lose their first love. And they stop telling people about Jesus. They don't tell people anything about Jesus, let alone, hey, you know what? Jesus Christ is coming back to our world. And if you'll let me, with your permission, I'd like to tell you how you can fall in love with Jesus or how you can know that he really is real. You know, we need to be so comfortable talking like that that it just rolls out like when we breathe, you know. When you breathe, that's kind of, you're pretty comfortable with breathing, aren't you? Because if you're not, you might not breathe much longer. And if you get to where you're not comfortable breathing, you go to the doctor and say, give me something, I can't breathe. Well, that's what we're talking about. You come to church because you need help breathing. Breathing the gospel. Giving the greatest gift of all time. That's what we're talking about. If you love his appearing, now this is a major clue here, you need to check yourself right now. If you're not telling people that Jesus is coming back for us, you don't have the love that it takes. But he does, and he'll give it to you free of charge. All you have to do is admit, say, Lord, I've been playing church. I don't know what I've been thinking. I've been caught up into some religious mess, but I'm ready for this. I'm ready for this with Paul, the apostle, not Pastor Paul, the apostle Paul in 2 Timothy. I'm ready for what he's talking about. 
ask him to give it to you, and I guarantee you, people around you are going to know that you love his return. Because what you love, who you love, and what you love, you always talk about. There's a connection from the heart to the mouth. Whatever's in your heart comes out here. If it's not there, it doesn't come out. And the devil's doing everything he can to cheat you out of giving the greatest gift of all eternity. You get it right there. You get it when you get together with other believers and you pray like crazy. You ask each other for forgiveness. You ask each other for help. And you pray like crazy. That's what they did. These people were wild with prayer. It was, it was orderly, but I mean, it was their, they knew this was their lifeline. And guess what? If you love that, I'll see you there. <laughs> because by God's grace, he's going to keep that fire burning in my bones that Jeremiah speaks of. He says, it was, it was like fire in my bones, he said. That's what Jeremiah said. He said, he said, I decided I wasn't going to talk for God anymore because they were just treating me like dirt. And I wasn't going to tell anybody about God. That's what he said. I wasn't going to tell anybody else about God because they were just, they didn't appreciate it and they didn't like it and they were going to treat me like dirt. They were treating me like dirt. That's what he told God. And then God reminded him who he was, who God was. And then Jeremiah says, it was like fire in my bones and I couldn't, I couldn't fulfill my threat. I had to go tell them how good he is and how much he wants us all in heaven. That's all we have to do. Tell people who he is and tell them how much he wants us in heaven and you do that by making a beeline right to the cross, right to the manger, right to the throne of grace in Hebrews 4. This is where God is calling us. Now, 2016 is about to end. And we're going to have communion next Sabbath. And we're going to have a prayer vigil Wednesday night. And if you can't be here for any, for any reason, it doesn't matter. I don't need to know. But if you can't be here, then I hope you're somewhere praying with somebody. In your house, or in your neighbor's house, or at work, or somewhere. Start a prayer ministry. This army, this army called the church, will move forward crawling on our knees. And we will see the glory of God. And if we die before we see it, we'll hear about it when we get to heaven. And all the prayers you pray will be answered, even if you never see them answered. God is faithful. As we close, we're going to pray. Now, I know we've gone over some people's stomach clock lunch bells are going off, but you're going to eat all weekend I mean, it's Christmas Eve and it's Christmas Day and you'll probably eat all week. <sighs> so if you don't have to go to a doctor's appointment or you don't have to go take care of someone who's sick right now or you don't have to go this very moment, I hope that you can stay and find someone to pray with. And if you've never prayed with another human being, then this is the most exciting, one of the most exciting moments of your, of your life. It, you could have that breakthrough today where you find the courage through Jesus Christ to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to go ask so-and-so if we can pray together. Maybe your first time. I tell you what, it's greater than riding a bicycle for the first time. I guarantee it. You can do it. All you have to do is say, Jesus, help me. You don't even have to say me, just Jesus, help and if you can't say that, just say, Jesus, he knows what you're asking. He'll come and help you. He's ready. He's our big brother. He's our mighty, mighty king. He's our wounded healer. He's our little baby in, in a manger. 
He's the one that was nailed to the cross saying, Father, forgive Paul Lundgren. He doesn't have a clue. That's who Jesus is. And he's, he, he's hoping and he's praying that you and I can get close enough to him that we can go and treat people the same way he did. Because that's what, that's what draws them to himself. So you get to do your own benediction for each other, pray with each other, pray for each other. If, if you came in here today and you were not living for Jesus Christ, I beg you to do it before you leave here today. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, Lord, take me back and, and, and let's go on from here. I guarantee you he will take you back. He will lead you from here. And if you want me to know about it, come tell me, text me, email me, call me, whatever. I'd love to know about it so I could pray with you. So right now it's time to pray. And you might want to sing. You know, when we did the anointing a while ago, I was ready to pray, and the Holy Spirit prompted me, impressed upon me, sing, I surrender all. And God loves it when we sing. If you come Wednesday night, I'll tell you something that God told me this last week that really helped me a lot. I don't have time right now, but God bless you as you pray for each other. We're here for each other because he was there, he's been there all the time for each of us. God bless you as you pray. Merry Christmas every day of the year. That's how these people did it every day. The Lord be with you as you go and as you pray with each other. Amen.